1 Kings, uh, chapter 17. 1 Kings, chapter 17. And we're going to start at verse 8. 1 Kings 17, verse 8. 8 through 12. This is going to be such a rich chapter for us. Um, we're coming from the lectionary today. This is a lectionary passage, um, and it's a really good word. So y'all ready to dive in? It says, verse 8, then the word of the Lord came to him. This is God talking to the prophet Elijah. Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gates of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, hey, bring me a little water in a vessel that I might drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, oh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord your as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. A handful of flour, a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elisha said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But first, make me a little cake of it. Bring it to me, and afterward, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day the Lord rain sends rain upon the earth. And... She went and did as Elijah said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. Can someone say, praise the Lord for God's word. It was rich all by yourself. I'm done. Y'all have a good day. It's the whole sermon. Now, today, I would like to speak to you from a topic entitled, Before I Let Go. Come on, can you put that in the chat? Before I Let Go. If you in the audience in here, can you just say that with me? Before I Let Go. So, there isn't a cookout, not a wedding, not a family reunion in black America where you won't hear one song in particular. Whether it's during the height of the summer, or summer season or a fall day when it's cold and there's a chill in the air, there's just something about Mays featuring Frankie Beverly's Before I Let Go that just makes you feel every, emotional, uh, every emotion available to humankind, amen? Do y'all agree with me? Anybody know the song? For some of y'all who may not know the song, I'm gonna bring you up to speed. I got a little video. I got a little video I wanna show, with, show to you. Um, this is an example of a black gathering. I had a little uh, birthday party. Yep, I'm ready for it. And this is me and my favorite person, my grandson. Take a look. Never, never let you go before I let go. Da, da, da. Hey. Okay, bring it back. The sister Donna told me to bring it back. I'm bringing it back. I'm at Sunday. I'm preaching. All right, not at a cookout. Okay, 
So that is an example. This is an example of what we know about before I let go. And these little children out here thinking Beyonce wrote this song and I'm mad about it on her homecoming album just because she added the little bunny hop and whatnot. No, kids, it's not by Beyonce. I just had to put that out there. So frankly, Beverly, he wrote this song. And he said he was inspired to write the song because of the relationship he was in. You know, we get like the, the side little dirt about the. He said he was in a relationship and it was hard. He said, he said, because I wasn't with the woman I wanted to be with and I couldn't stay with the one I was with. Lord have mercy. That's it. Anybody ever been in a quandary? You ever been in a, in a rock in a hard place? Have you ever been there before where you just didn't know what to do? You couldn't move forward, you couldn't go back. I just, I don't know what to do. That's why he wrote, I got to make sure I'm right. I want to speak to those today who are at the end of their proverbial end of the rope. I want, this is who I'm, this is who discernment is for today. For those who, you've done all you can do. You've cried, you prayed, you tried to figure it out on your own. You went through every avenue, every means, every strategy. you just trying to work it out. And you're at the point where you're starting to lose hope. Has anyone been there before? When you are, the, the worst one, the worst part of these situations is when you're waiting for other people to get up to speed and there's nothing you could do about it. Like you got to wait on the other person. I'm, you know, like I can't control you, so I'm just waiting for you to get your stuff together, right? And sometimes when you're in these hopeless situations, there's a time where you're like, you know what, I'm just going to have to take an L on this one. Like I think I'm, this is, I'm just going to have to cut my losses. Um, maybe it's a job. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a family member you've been talking, you've been praying for. Maybe it's a failed dream. Maybe it's a career. And you're saying, I am literally about to let go. Now, I do want to make one caveat. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about toxic things. Amen? It's like some things you're going to have to let go if they're toxic or if they're abusive. So this is not the category of toxic or abusive. There's a difference between toxicity and irritating, all right? There's a, there's a difference between toxic and annoying. I'm talking about the annoying things, the things that God, you thought you heard God said, the promises that God has spoken to you, you don't see it, and you're losing hope, and you're about to let go. Am I preaching to the right people? I got, and am I right people in the chat? Are y'all all right? I'm making sure I'm in the right neighborhood. Well, I just want to give you... A little encouragement today from our passage. Our passage is something that will really speak life to us today and that will give us a little hope before you let go. Before you better make sure you write. We're gonna make sure we write before we let go. So I wanna give you a little context of the verse we just read, 1 Kings 17. Elijah, in the beginning of this verse, and I really hope you would take this verse for the week and go home and read it. It's so good. The whole chapter is so good. Elijah, um, he comes on the scene. If you look at verse chapter 16, there's been king after king, some good, some bad. Some make Israel fall off. Some are worshiping idols. Some are good. It was, it's just a mess. So Elijah steps on the scene. He's like, you know what? I'm declaring a drought. That's it. No more rain will fall until I say so. And God honored his word. And so in the midst of this, God led him to a brook. You know, he had fresh water. He had, like, provision. God sent a raven to him of all creatures. He sent this raven, which was in the category of a dirty uh, animal. It was not clean. But God used something that was unclean to take care of the man of God. That's a whole word by itself, how God will use the least likely things and will feed you and take care of you when you never thought that is. That's a whole nother sermon for another day. But something strange happened. He like, who I called the drought, but I got my provision. I got my brook. I got my food coming from the birds. I'm good. And I want to, one more thing about that bird. You know, ravens are scavengers. So they're not looking out for nobody but themselves. Y'all see them? Birds, blackbirds, crows, they be about it. So for a bird to share was really God. Um, there's some people who are going to share in your life that you never thought would share, and it's going to be only God. That's another message. But something crazy happens. The brook dries up. 
The provision that God sent him to dried up. The birds went away. Something happened. It was, a, it was a collision between his confession and reality. So he confessed that nothing is going to happen. And then the reality came to it like, now I ain't got no food because of what I said. And now we've been there before. Because have you been in a place where you made a declaration over your life? I'm not calling them no more. And then you lonely. See, your confession and your reality collides. I'm not spending no more extra money on nothing, on no food, no fast food, nothing. And then the, re the reality is that you're hungry and you got to cook for yourself. You got a grocery shop, you got to do that. See, this is when your confession and your reality don't line up. I'm done with turning to this habit when I'm sad. I'm just going to leave it alone. But the reality is now I have to be alone with my thoughts and my feelings and my emotions. What do you do when your confession collides with your reality? This is where we find the prophet Elijah. He's declared this drought, but now he ain't got no food and he ain't got no water. So I love him, though. He stayed steadfast in it. He didn't be like, okay, drought's over. He could have did that. But, you know, if we, this is where we pick up in our story. It's verse 8. Verse 8, God says, you know, don't worry, I got you. I have commanded a widow in Zarephath to feed you. He's like, okay, cool, 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 cool. I'll just go over to Zarephath, a little Gentile town. You know, they don't really know, you know, about the Lord. But I'm just going to go over there. Um, Seraphath, he's like, okay, okay, I'm looking for a widow. I want you to really put your, yourself in Elijah's shoes. Sometimes we go through these Bible stories and we just think everything magically happens. But really put yourself in Elijah's shoes. He's going to this town. By the way, the town Zarephath, it means a smelting pot or a, a smelting shop or a refining, a place where you, or where you refine metals. So God is sending him to a place of refining. And he goes to this town, and can you just imagine him? All he has is God's instruction. I'm going to send, I'm going to command a widow to feed you. He's like, cool. You want to give me how she look, hair color, eye color, what she wearing? Is she wearing red today? Like, what we doing? No. He just tells him to go. He's like, cool, I'll go. Can you imagine him walking through the town like, widow, widow, widow. Oh, no, she married. Um... Widow, no, she a little too young. Oh, okay, widow. Okay, this looks like this might be her right here. This might be her. He pulls up to this one lady. He's like, I think this is her. I think this is her. I'm going to test it out. Hey, 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 excuse me. Can, I, uh, can you give me some water? And she's like, oh, okay, water. I'll get you some water. He's like, I think this is her. All right, cool, 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 cool. I'm gonna, let me throw one more question. I got to test because, you know, see if I throw it out there, if she, if she going to pick up what I'm putting down. Because remember... God said that he going to command a widow. So he's like, good, I'm just going to throw it out there. So he's like, hey, um, why are you getting some water? Can you, can you uh, give me a little bread while you at it? And she was like, that's when she was like, well, what? hold on, bro. Like, wait a minute. Now you think, I'm thinking in my mind that when he throws out, can you give me a bread? He's expecting her to be like, you know what? God just put on my heart that somebody was about to come Two months, and I said, I saved this little crumb of burden just for you. I'm sure that's what he was thinking. Like, I know she, I'm just going to throw it out there, and she's going to pick it up. Instead, we get a little something different. She didn't get the memo somewhere. She didn't get the memo that God wanted to use her. <laughs> God said, I'm going to command her. She was like, I didn't, when did God say that? Now, put yourself in her perspective. Put yourself in her shoes. Her and her son were on the verge of starvation. Now, think about this. This passage is telling her, telling us her thought process as she was foraging for sticks. Now, she's looking for sticks because maybe all the, the good pieces have already been taken. She, she's a widow. She really doesn't have anybody to look out for her. She has no protection. She has no form of income. She's, like, cut off. She doesn't need, there's no welfare in place for people who have lost their husbands, who was their main source of income. This, her son must have been young because he can't really go out and work. So she's on her own, sits out here on her own, single mother out here, just trying to survive. And her thought process is in verse 12. She said, I'm just gathering a couple of sticks 
so I could prepare it for myself and for my son that we may eat it and die. That was her mindset. She's an outsider. She's not. And, you know, if you look at the verse, she didn't even say, like, she's as sure as the Lord, your God. She wouldn't even have a relationship with God. She was an outsider. She said, she told Elijah, your God, not my God, it's your God. So you would think Elijah's response would be one of understanding. Like, oh, yeah, my bad, sis. Oh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead, finish picking up your sticks. You do you, boo. Go ahead and handle that. All right, my bad. Wrong widow. You think that was his response? You might turn that down a little bit. Um, would you, um, do you think that was her response? That was not his response towards her. His response instead is in verse 13. Verse 13. Listen what he says to Elijah. Do not, I mean what Elijah says to her. Do not be afraid. Go and do as you've said. But first, make a little cake of it and bring it to me. I know she was like, sir. Excuse, sir. Go make a, a, a do what now? Like, I already told you my situation. I don't have nothing. I just have a whole, I just got a little flour, a little oil, a little flour, a little oil, a little flour. A little oil. This man talking about make a whole cake. Why don't you go ahead and make me a cake first and then do what you, whatever you're going to do with your son, and then y'all can do that afterwards. This is an amazing concept because she didn't even understand that this day she was making her own, her own cake for her own surprise party. God was about to blow her mind in this moment. God was about to blow her mind, and that's where I feel like God has us in this situation in your situation, in your current uh, situations, that God is about to blow your mind. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the situation that you think that you're in right now that seems impossible, perhaps it's a setup that God is about to blow your mind? Y'all don't believe me yet, so we're going to keep going. We're going to keep going because I want to share with you just a couple of points, a couple of words of encouragement if you are at the end of your world, but if you are ready to give up, and if you are losing hope, there's a few things I want you to remember before you let go, all right? Before you let go. The first thing, number one, before you let go, remember what the prophet said. Do not fear. This is in verse 13. The first thing he said to her is do not fear. See, she thought death was her only option. Think about this. She was like, I'm going to make this thing, and then I've done all I can do. I'm out of options. I'm out of, you know, anything. I don't have any more resources. We are going to eat this little meal. This is going to be our last supper, and we're, we're just going to die. We're at it. We, we, there's nothing else. I have nothing else. I don't know if you've been there before. I've been there before. I don't, I've, I've exhausted every resource, every idea. There's nothing else. And she thought her only option was death. Now, I do want to take a quick turn here and really speak from my heart to those who are watching, those who are in the building, those who will watch this later, who are struggling with pseudo suicidal ideologies. I want to talk to you. I want you to know that death is not your only alternative. Death is not your only option. Like, that is a lie. You still have life. You still have hope. And I know our mental health and our issues can get cloud. It can cloud our judgment. But you need to hear from people who love you, who care about you, that death is not your only way out of your pain. That there is nothing, that God has life for you, God has hope for you, that God has joy for you. It's just on the other side of this situation. And I do have a slide that I want to show that is very important, that there is a slide. I don't know if y'all can see. If you are struggling with su 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 suicidal thoughts, if you are having these kind of there's these um, thought processes. There is a resource that we want you to screenshot. Please write it down. If you have someone who's struggling with this, there's a phone number. There's a website. They cater to people of color, people who are in um, oppressed, marginalized situations. 
please hear it from us that we love you and that your life has purpose. And that is there is hope and joy on the other side of the situation. Do not let go. Do not think that this is your only option. I hope this story will give you hope in life and that you will not let go. Can somebody say amen? Amen, amen, amen. Okay, we could go back to the other slide unless people still are looking at that. She was thinking death was her only option, and she was scared. She was scared of running out. She was scared. She had a a fear of scarcity. You you know, if you're from the hood, you know all about this. These scarcity narratives that we all grow up with, that we just, there's just never enough. That we got to scratch and survive. We got to hustle and grind. We got to go for ours. We got to get it while the getting's good. I work at a school and our kids are always stealing free stuff. I'm like, y'all don't, y'all don't have to steal stuff. I brought the snacks for you. You don't have to steal them. But we just have this thing like, oh, I got to take what I can because I don't know when I'm going to get it again. Scarcity narratives um, translate into our experiences, into our lives. And we also translate this into how we deal with each other. I don't have any more hope. I don't have enough love. I don't have no more love. I don't have no more forgiveness. I'm out. I'm tapped. I don't got no more words of encouragement. I don't got no more. I, I'm done. There's no more. My resource, my well is dry. There's scarcity. There, we think that there's not enough. People are on, you know what? That is my phone. Can y'all tell you that? I was like, what am I hearing? Can you turn my, my phone like down? Yes. But when you are out of everything. I don't have any hope. I don't have any joy. I don't have any love. That's a scarcity narrative that you have to talk to yourself and you have to tell yourself that you serve a God of abundance. You serve a God of abundance. There is more love in you. There is more joy. There is no hope. I'm out of peace. No, that's a scarcity narrative. There is more. There is more. So before you let go, we're not going to let fear rule us. We're not going to let the fear of running out the fear of they're going to take advantage of me if I keep being nice. We're not going to let that. We got, I'm always the one doing everything. That's a, that's a fear. It comes from a scarcity there. We think if we give out that we won't give back. So point two, before you let go, realize that you may not have the finished product, but you have the ingredients. Come on. You may not have the finished product in your hand, but you got the ingredients you need for a miracle. Can somebody say amen? Look at what the lady said. I keep telling you, she, all she said, I have nothing baked. I didn't put nothing to say. I only have a handful of flour and a little oil. A handful of flour and a little oil. Realize that you already have in your possessions the ingredients for a miracle. She didn't even know she was sitting on her miracle. All she was focused on was her little. So that business idea is inside of you. I may not have the business But the idea is inside of me. My relationship is a little rocky right now. But we have the the capability and the capacity to love and be in a functional relationship. You know, I might, you know, be a little short-tempered. I might have a little anger problem. But I do have the fruit of the Spirit. And it is going to be living and operating inside of me. Every miracle in the Bible requires some form of participation. Please hear me on this. Go through, read the whole Bible. And you just see if sometimes there is, when it comes to human beings, God's always like, what you got? What's in your hand? Stretch out your hand. Come over here. Go walk over there. Pick up your mat. There's always something that requires our participation, but we call it little. We call it little. She thought all she had was a little bit. Somebody say little. Before you let go, point number three, you got to learn kingdom math. You got to learn kingdom math. And this could also be translated kingdom, like we are kinfolk to each other. But you got to learn some kingdom math. If you don't know how to do kingdom math, you ain't going to get it. And you know, I, wasn't a, I wasn't a real math person growing up. But when, you know, all especially the new math, nobody who is in junior high or higher, don't ask me for no help with math. I'm no help. I can help you with your times tables. I can help you with your adding and subtraction. The simple, don't ask me for to do this new math. I'm not good with the new math. But there is a math that all of us must learn, and it's kingdom math. 
Look at verse 17. I mean, verse 13, Elijah said to her, do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said. But first, make me a little cake of it. Bring it to me. And afterwards, make something for yourself and your son. It don't even make sense. I told you I got a handful of flour and a little bit of oil. Make a whole cake for you and then for me. Like, it don't make sense. But this is always God's recipe for a miracle. This is always God's recipe for a miracle. Bring me your little, and I will multiply it. Bring me your little, and I will multiply it. Bring me your little, and I will multiply it. Where do we remember this? Where do we remember this from? From the, come on, come on, sis. That's what I'm saying. Remember the, the loaves and the fish? Remember the little baby? He All he had was a little lunch. Bring me your little, and I'll feed a whole crowd. Bring me what you think that you don't have enough of and watch what I do with it. It's kingdom math. Will you give God your little? Will you trust God with your little? Will you stop making excuses just because you got a little? Because everybody has a little. Everybody has something in their lives that they seem insignificant and little. Everyone has something that they would launch out and do, but it just seems too little. And it don't help because everybody like, how your little business doing? Like, wait, we thinking of it as a little, like, you kind of like coming for my business. But it's little. What would your life look like if you operated without fear? What, if, what would it look like if you just did it, if you went for it? If you gave your life, God, I don't have much. It's a little business idea. It's a little dream. It's a little miracle. All I got is a little bit of love left for the people who are on my nerves. I just got a little bit of forgiveness, a little bit of energy, because you know they tap dancing on that last nerve, Lord. I only got a little. But what if we took that little and gave it to God? If you kingdom math, if you want more, you got to give it away. If you hold on to it, you lose it. If you want to be great in the kingdom, you got to serve. You got to go down the way up. It's all kingdom math. If you don't get the kingdom economics, you will lose out on the blessing that God has to you. Will you bring that gift, that talent, the thing you think that is little, will you bring it to God and serve with your gift? This is what I mean. Will you take that thing that you're passionate about, that you want God to bless, maybe that business idea, and use it for the kingdom or use it to serve someone for free? Give it away. Volunteer. Do charity work. Go to a business that needs you. Go to a daycare. Volunteer at a school. Do something. Do it for free. And then watch God multiply it. It's kingdom principles. If you want to do something great, sow into it. Sow into somebody else's. Make somebody else's dream happen. Don't just be so focused on, I'm on, I got to get out there. I got to get my brand going. Hey, why don't you help somebody else? And why is kingdom economics? It's kingdom math. Watch God multiply your little. So in conclusion, I really love this widow. I love this widow. She didn't even know God signed her up to participate in a miracle. She didn't even know it. So what you see, it, what it teaches us that what you see as lack is somebody else's solution to a problem. What you see as lack in your life will bring somebody else life. What you, what your, her yes answered a need for somebody else. Your yes is connected to lives. Your yes is connecting to somebody's livelihood, somebody's joy, somebody's peace. Your, your yes can change lives. So the moral of the story, before you let go, watch what God does in your life before you let go, change how you see your little. We're gonna change our narratives. Change how you see your little. How you see your little. You got funders? Nope. You got blue check and lots of followers? Nope. Sure don't. You got like the perfect mentor. You got ready people to know. I don't. I don't even have that. Nope. You got your relationship all figured out, right? Y'all. Y'all good? Y'all no. Mm-mm. Nope. Don't even got it. But see, that gap is the opportunity for a miracle, right? That's where God does the work, is in that gap. 
And I wish you would please get a hold of this. Watch what, when you say, watch, watch what God will do with my lack. That's where the miracle is. The miracle happens in the gap because you know it wasn't you at the end of the day. You know this lady was like, I did not have it, y'all. I don't know why we still eating because all I had was a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. Same with your life. God doesn't, we, a lot of times we're waiting to be, for it to be perfect. We're waiting for him to have our stuff together, waiting to have the business plan perfected. That's, you know, that's, that's not faith, right? God wants us to step out on faith. If you, faith is doing it when you can't see it. What, what we want is a strategy. We want it all mapped out. We want to see how it's going to go. We got goals, objectives. That's a strategy, boo. God's not blessing the strategy. God is going to bless your faith. Step out on faith. Stop waiting for God to give you every single detail. That's not faith. You can't see it. Walk out on faith. So this is the miracle of it, that God will get the glory out of your life because you know in your heart that it wasn't you. So I'm praying this blessing over you. This is the blessing that I'm praying over all who are watching, all who are in the building. It comes from verse 15. And it says, she went and did as Elijah said. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. This is the prayer I'm praying over you, that when you act in faith, when you step out and do what God has told you to do, that you will have abundance in every area of your life. And I'm not just talking about finances. I'm talking about abundance in your joy, in your peace, in your purpose, abundance in your energy, abundance in your focus, abundance in how you're going to get things done. This is the prayer. It won't run out. You serve a God where it won't run out. If you extend, extend some more kindness to somebody, God, won't, God will replenish you. God will not leave you dry. God will not leave you in a place where you're wanting. He, you will not run out. It is up to you to continue to go to the water of life, amen, to the bread of life, who is Jesus. It is our job to keep replenishing ourselves with the life-giving essence of who our Savior is, amen, and then you will never run out. Lastly, I'll say, I wish I could say that this story ended in a happily ever after, because that's what Disney tells us, right? Every story is supposed to end in and the end. Um, but later in this chapter, chapter 17, 1 Kings 17, this same woman's son dies suddenly. What do you do when your life takes a dramatic turn? When you did all the things and things still go wrong. I'm going to let you read the rest of the chapter to find out. Y'all got homework. Read 1 Kings 17. Find out how this story ends. All right, I'm going to leave you on a cliffhanger. Find out how the rest of the story turns out. Um, we're going to end on some sailor questions, some questions I want you to stop and reflect on throughout the week. The first thing I want you to think about, look at your life. Where are you losing hope? Where are you losing love? Losing patience in your life. Two, what seems impossible right now because of your little, quote unquote, what seems impossible to you? I would, but, you know, I don't even got enough. Three, are you willing to see your little through the eyes of God? How would that change your scarcity narrative? If you really believe that you serve a God that won't run out, that God will give you everything you need, the grace on your life, the grace to deal with difficult people, the grace to deal with difficult situations, that God will take that little bit you got and multiply it. So let's just close in prayer. And as we're praying, I want you to think about that thing that you seem little and that seems little and insignificant in your life. And we're going to lay it before God. We're just going to put it on the altar. We're going to say, God, take 
this thing. I got a dream. I got a hope. I got a vision. I got a promise for, from you, but it just, it, I'm losing hope in this area. God, it doesn't seem like I have enough. It doesn't seem like I fit the bill. I feel like an imposter. I feel like I'm not the one cut out for this job. I don't think I have what it takes. Will you lay that on the altar right now and give it to God? Will you give it to God right now and say, God, here is my little. I give it to you like the woman gave the prophet a cake that she didn't even have. I give it to you like the little kid gave you the fish and the loaves. God, will you take it and multiply it in my life? I give it to you by faith. God, help me not to let go in the places where you've told me to, to hold on. God, let me be steadfast in those areas, even when I get discouraged, even when I feel like there's no hope left, when I can't see another option, when I can't see a way out. Let me ever look to you, the author and the finisher of my faith, because you are faithful. We love you so much, God, and we just pray this blessing over everyone watching, God, that they would experience what it's like to live in the abundance of your purpose. That we, we, when we're in the will of God, it's the safest place that we could ever be. That you will keep us, you will guide us, and you will direct us. And you will give us everything we need for life and godliness because it's already inside of us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.